Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Uh, especially as an Antarctic tragic, since I was about this high, I'm delighted to be here, and I thank John for uh, inviting me. Now I know what Antarctic scientists look like. That is fabulous, terrific. Now, don't we love our p-values? That's the significance, the key to publication, grants, jobs, fame, Nobel Prizes. I'm going to leave this here carefully, so please keep an eye on it. I don't want any, it's very special, okay. Now, here are a whole lot of websites, our book over there, and you've got bookmarks, please help yourself. Uh, our book and blog information there, and a couple of, I hope, helpful links. These slides will be, in a day or two, available uh, via this link, so that's all you need to write down, and you can follow up um, uh, references. Now, this was going to be telegraphic. It's going to be even more so, since it's almost 20 past, but after two uh, in discussion, I'm very willing to expand on any of the things, and after two, uh, more so, and also happy to discuss issues that uh, you may care to raise. So here's a question for you. You carry out a study and calculate exactly as it happened, P.05. I know nothing about the study and design anything but that. So suppose you replicated precisely the same but with new samples. Well, what sort of, of course you won't get exactly the same p-value, but within what sort of range would you expect 80% chance to get this one, this one, this one? And so here are your options. I'm not going to ask you to call out your answers, but just ponder on it for a second or two and lock yourself in on one of those answers. Now, think back to when you first heard about this whole significance testing thing. You probably had some experience like some rather harried teacher late on a Friday afternoon quickly having to tell you about t-tests and so they explain well first you make an assumption etc you can read it there and using that assumption you do this arcane thing in the computer to calculate some quantity that I can't really explain and then you compare that with a benchmark that nobody can really justify but it's traditional it's absolutely set in stone and that leads you to make some conclusions. Well, you recognise what I'm talking about uh, here. And that's why so many of our brightest students, I think, in the intro course are highly confused and wonder why grown-ups in universities do this. And alas, some of them, I suspect, are lost to science because of this insight. And it's a really interesting question. Why on earth we've stuck with it? for so long. <laughs> and that's really what you learn as a graduate student. Somehow or other, you have to uh, get under. So, but if P tells us truth, as we seem to believe, if we did it again, we should get the same truth, surely, or pretty close. What's the sampling variability? Now, here I'm going to be particularly uh, telegraphic and go and just show very briefly. Here we've got an experiment. You can make a cover story of the crustacean shell thickness in this pH and then in some other pH and you run an experiment. You've got 32 observations here and the other group 32 and mean and 95% confidence intervals and here's the difference. And so this experiment is estimating a difference of about 14 between the two samples. We can do it again, and the next one happens to estimate about six. Okie doke, and you can uh, run those down, and we get the dance of the confidence intervals, and that's exactly what you expect by the definition of a confidence interval as one from such an infinite sequence. Now, let's think about p-values. So we turn on p-values, and this result is well clear of zero, the null hypothesized value, and so we get two stars. Hooray! Well on the way for that Nobel Prize. We get another one, and oh, it's dangerously close to touching. It's only just 0 0.03. What an incredible relief. And so we... Now, 
Here we have our dance of the conference intervals exactly as before and as we should get and as we expect. We can translate each one across to a p value and after a tiny bit of practice, or we'll read chapter 6 in the book, you'll be able to eyeball that and there are the p values. So here's the variability that makes sense. Now just look at this incredible range of p values there. We've got three stars, hooray, Nobel Prize. We've got um, everything up to what's these low ones, and here we've got 0.2, and here we've got another 0.2, and so we've got all sorts of values there, and if we kept on, we'd get even more. And so, over on the right is the dance of the P values. You can play this at parties and uh, enjoy it, okay? Freeform dance like that. Now, let's go back to our... Um, uh, here, and here's my uh, conclusion. If you report a confidence interval, then that single confidence interval is very informative because the length of the interval gives you some idea of the amount of bouncing around in the infinite sequence from which that confidence interval came. But if I tell you a single p-value, do you have the slightest clue what the whole dance, what the whole infinite sequence is that it came from? Pretty much no. And so although in a sense these two are equivalent, you can translate between, in a very important informative and psychological sense, a confidence interval is much more informative. Dance of the p-values, that's uh, a YouTube video that you can uh, follow if you wish, have a look up if you wish. Oh, um, I showed this, oh, this computer does funny things with photos. Uh, I showed this elephant seal a p-value and that was the response. And then that realized what it was and that was their response. Smelt terrible, you probably know that. Now this is nothing new. We've had more than half a century of very leading scholars. And you can read some of these things, particularly the highlighted bit. These are very strong statements about any statistical technique, let alone one that is used pretty much right across science as the keystone for everything. It's a bizarre thing, and my psychological and history and philosophy of science colleagues are really pressed to try and understand why it happened. And I'm not being highly selective here, virtually nobody has published cogent, considered, detailed counter-arguments hey, hang on a tick, here are the reasons why p-values are so valuable and informative. Just hasn't happened. This is the sound of one hand clapping, not a debate. Most importantly, in 2016, the very bottom quote, the American Statistical Association, real grown-up statisticians who've been rather patronising towards us lesser mortals for screwing up with significance testing, realised that long last there was a problem and they published their statement about the p-value. In October last year, they had a big seminar that considered post p less than 05 techniques and th these papers, uh, I gave comments on a draft of one of these this morning, uh, will come out in the American Statistician in due course. So introducing the idea of the post p less than 05 era, which is an imprimatur from those real grown-up statist uh, statisticians that if we change, we may well be doing the right thing. In fact, we'd be totally wrong to continue. Uh, now that sort of problems with p-values, just a few words about open science, which is sort of the positive uh, aspect of what we're actually going to do. And this uh, was prompted to some extent by this, one of the most famous publications in science, been cited five gazillion times in medicine, and unfortunately it's not very well written in my view, but my interpretation is it says there are three core reasons why using P05 is so damaging. First, selective publication. All those pilot tests, all those big serious experiments that don't achieve 05, they stay in the bottom drawer because you know investing time in getting them published is probably wasted time. So what we see in the journals will be a very slanted subset of what's been done. 
Second, you're under immense pressure and you're probably feeling it more and more year by year from your dean, your manager, your funding agency. You've got to get those A-plus publications. So of course, you've got to find significance. You put months into collecting this data. There's got to be something there. And so you ferret around. And the statisticians have a saying that um, if you torture the data sufficiently, they will confess. And so p-hacking is this uh, term for tweaking and selecting and collecting a bit more data and so on and so on to, um, uh, to get p less than 05. And then if we give such reverence statistical significance, of course, once it's out there in a journal, accepted, peer-reviewed, and then it's, it's fact. And unless there are extraordinary reasons, it's hard to get funding or motivation to do replications. And even if you do, it's going to be hard to get them published. And so these three things together are a devastating triple storm, which mean that um, we really do need to change. And so it could be that after half a century of the super tanker of p-values just plowing ahead, we might have the motivation and perhaps the energy and the uh, widespread support across science to move on. Open science is a set of techniques to overcome this crisis, partly or centrally by everything being open and published no matter what the results are. And as part of that, the new statistics, which is what I'm arguing for, is confidence intervals and meta-analysis. That could be Bayesian, that's perfectly fine, but estimation. Uh, ask how much questions, how big, how much, to what extent, and give estimation answers. This probably comes as second nature to many of you. Uh, it's much less so in biomedicine and in across the social and behavioral sciences. But still, the focus should be on that. And once you've got it, um, those estimates, you don't need p-values at all. And so here's the, the brief um, uh, list of things that open science uh, calls for, and I'll talk more about that um, on request. So here are the intuitions. Are you thinking further about maybe you want to revise your answer? Uh, in fact, if you look here at the blue curve, that is the uh, probability density function of the p-value for the first experiment, the first replication after getting at p equals 0.05 result. So you're more like the area under the blue curve, of course, is 1. And you're more likely to get a value down here low, but there's still tons of area out here all the way up. And in fact, from that distribution, you can just uh, figure it out quite simply. And again, I'll explain later that these are the, uh, is it 38 things on a roulette wheel? These are 38 values, seven of them three stars, 15 of them p less than, p greater than 0.1. Put them around a video, uh, put them around a roulette wheel, and spinning this wheel is precisely equivalent to replicating your study and seeing what p value you get. So I'll offer you at a very introductory low price today a p value which will save you months of work. Um, and if you care to look up um, these videos, you can see that sort of all explained into, um, in YouTube. So in fact, the answer is this bottom one, you probably guessed that by now. And <clears throat> after 05, this is the p interval. There's an 80% chance you get a value in there, which means a 10% chance your p value will actually be greater than 0.65, 10% less than this point, so many noughts. Two. You don't believe me, but it's true, and I've supported the analysis by um, simulation. Even more remarkably, possibly, Provided your replication matches your first study, it doesn't matter what uh, the measure, the power, the n, the true effect size at all. If the first study got 05, then this is the uh, uh, p interval. And um, here, say, if you get 0.01, then the p interval is this. And there's actually about a 1 in 6 chance that a straight replication of this first study won't even give you 05. And yet think, three stars, you think, boy, that's bankable. That's halfway to the Nobel Prize. But if somebody else does a replication faithfully following exactly, 
and they get this, then you think disaster, something screwed up somewhere, they're not doing it properly. But it could just be uh, the role of the die. Oh yes, so will you join the Gen 2 Penguin and uh, be the uh, disruptor and try and um, wake up the crab eater there? Uh, I'm going to skip over that because we've got... Uh, and skip over that. There is the uh, contents list of the book and I'll be very happy to talk about um, software and techniques for any of these things uh, shortly. And there is my... Uh, summary there and shortly this um, link should get to these slides. <laughs> Only a bit over. Um, I'll pass over to my uh, learned colleagues. Thank you very much. I do? Thank you. So I'm not talking about experimental design. Oh, I am talking about experimental design. I'm not talking about p-values because those of you who know me well know that my statistics is not my greatest strength. But I am good at designing experiments and um, what I'm going to do is just tell you a story about ocean acidification and how the uh, experimental design developed over time and some of the problems that um, occurred early on. And it's called Don't Mess With The Press and you'll see why shortly. So ocean acidification, it's actually a fairly recent research field. One of the first papers was Caldera and Wicket in 2003 and this was a modeling study which showed projections of what pH is going to be like in a future ocean. And so th those projections were quite dire. It's been cited 2,077 times. So subsequent to that, we had Raven et al. This is the Royal Society Review, and this is the paper that first highlighted the uh, possibilities of negative impacts on biology, like as in almost marine life. And this is not necessarily negative, but impacts nevertheless. And then... Straight after that, there came out a bunch of what we'd have to call doom and gloom papers that the world is going to end and ocean acidification is a terrible thing, etc. And But some of these, despite being published in Nature, are actually using what I'd have to describe as questionable methodologies. So here's an example, and I hope no one knows this group. <laughs> so, sorry. But... Um, this is a good example of when a new research field starts. This, the stuff that gets published is the, you know, the exciting high impact stuff. And what this, this was an experiment in Kaneohe Bay in um, Hawaii. And what they did, they had three, three replicates, one, two, three, one, two, three. The, uh, the um, high pH replicate was created here by mixing tap water with hydrochloric acid. Now, I can tell you that that would not be acceptable anymore. And they did show quite nicely that if you do that, then instead of having beautiful pink coralline algae, you get a bunch of um, green algae. But th this is an example of um, not appropriate methods. And the field moved on fairly quickly, and the field was lucky because it had this seminal uh, publication, The Guide to Best Practices. So that came out in 2010. This is interesting. Now, I'm just focusing on one aspect of this um, guide, and this is the laboratory musicosm studies, and that's what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here isn't relevant to field work, just so you know. Um, so this book was great. It had a whole bunch of chapters that went to step you through a whole load of things you need to consider about and best practices for running an experiment. And 
I think the thing in this book that the biologists got absolutely hung up on was this part here, is that you have to correctly manipulate seawater chemistry in order to do an OA experiment. So you can't use hydrochloric acid. Well, you can, but it, it doesn't tell you anything about ocean acidification. So the, the biologists got hung up on this because biologists didn't know how to do this. So biologists obsessed about carbonate chemistry but seem to forget about the basic rules in experimental design. And this is what I'll go to. And the problem is, is that independent replication in experiments, when you, have to, when you have to care about the carbonate chemistry, it's actually hard to do, and it's expensive. So these systems that have been put together for looking, testing the effects of ocean acidification on biology rigorously, uh, probably $100,000 minimum to, do, to build. So a lot of this early work was not necessarily doing things right. And interestingly, the biologists were hung up about this part, the chemistry, but they seem to have completely ignored John's chapter for designing ocean acidification experiments to maximize interference, influence. So yeah, it must have been that. <laughs> anyway. So now to my part of the story. I started doing um, ocean acidification work in New Zealand, and we were quite early. We, we started this work quite early on. Um, and there was a team of us, chemists, biologists, etc., and we were designing systems correctly. So these were, but they took years to build, and we weren't publishing. And there was a certain, this is Chris Cornwall, who was a very talented postdoc uh, in my lab. He's a PhD student with me too. And... He, we were getting frustrated by these publications keep coming out, which were not replicated properly, which weren't d doing all these things. So Chris, I said, Chris, well, you know, why don't you, go, why don't you quantify it? So we did a meta-analysis of 460 experiments, lab and mesocosm on ocean acidification. And he examined it for the, this for two things. Had the best practices guide impacted the the chemistry. Was the chemistry being done better than before the best practices guide? Um, so were people still using hydrochloric acid or not? And indeed, it, the, the guide had made a big impact. The number of inappropriately um, done studies dropped from 21 to 3 percent. Had the best practices guide, John's chapter, made a difference to um, by replication, independent replication and well-designed experiments, no, it had had no effect. And uh, this is what the figure looks like here. So methods of carbon dioxide manipulation, big improvement. Carbonate chemistry, big improvement. But experimental design and analysis, no effect. And just, I'm not going to go, I don't really want to talk about experimental design, um, but the paper covers, uh, b based on Hilbert et al., what are good experimental designs, so random, randomly, randomized, randomized block, or systematic, are all acceptable experimental designs. And then it runs through all the B, the B designs, of which there are five, which are less appropriate experimental designs. Some of them are completely inappropriate, i.e. no replication. But some of these designs actually can work as long as you do the correct statistical analyses around, around it. But the other problem was that people weren't reporting the statistics. They weren't saying what the design was, and then they were doing all sorts of odd things, pooling data and so on, that were just inappropriate. So I got the papers published. This email came through from Chris. It's like, oh, wow, Nature, Nature want to highlight our paper. It's like, yay, awesome. Uh, journalist question. This is the questions that, that the journalist sent. Are you concerned about the problems you found? And when Chris, he sent through the responses to me, and his first response was, yes, I am concerned. And all I could see was this, you know, pub article coming out in Nature, scientists concerned, Sci it looked like it's all rubbish. And this is what, what our intention was. Um, uh, anyway, so this, uh, here's the, <laughs> this is the story that came out. We gave an extremely measured response to this. We were very... Um, said really positive things about the field and that, you know, this is what we were trying to achieve, just trying to achieve rigor and so on. Unfortunately, <laughs> they didn't go, they, they, unfortunately, they asked a number of other colleagues around the world who made other quotes that were really quite negative about the whole field of ocean acidification. Um, so here, 
this is what they said, the experiments are inappropriate or did not meet the methods properly, blah, blah. Luckily, Chris had this very positive comment in there, which is what saved us. Anyway, this comes out. I'm sitting in my office working. Uh, Philip Boyd runs into my office and says, oh my God, you've got to do something. It's all going mad out there. He was in a, re a group of people who were sending him emails saying, oh, what? look at this. This is terrible disaster for our research area. Why was it a disaster? Why were they so upset about this? This is why, because it was the, just before the Paris Climate Change Agreement, and they were working really hard lobbying governments, saying how important OA was and what a problem it was for a future, for the, you know, for, re, for what, what a environmental problem it was. And why did they have good right to be concerned about that? Because then the, the dailies picked it up, and this is the Daily Mail. Um, they say flaws undermine confidence on impact of ocean. <laughs> acidic oceans, it comes months after figures revealed the Arctic ice cap regrew. <laughs> so suddenly, this myth is being propagated in the international literature. Anyway, the take-home, there is no take-home message, this is just a story. The, it honestly was a storm in the teacup. It was a very stressful at the time, but it was a storm in the teacup. Um, I got my first and only publication in Nature, <laughs> which was 200 words long. We did a rebuttal um, against that because we had to do this. Uh, and actually, we got an apology from the, um, the journalist who wrote it, believe it or not. He was very upset. And the positive thing is that once this storm in the teacup, you know, blew over, what we did do in this paper, it was called Problems and Solutions. We, dis we gave five ways that you can design an OA experiment rigorously and, you know, with not necessarily expensively. And so we provided solutions to these experimental design problems, and they've been widely adopted. It's been cited 73 times so far. And I think um, I'm going to have to say, tell Chris that 2020, you might want to do another meta-analysis to see if this paper has had an impact on how OA studies are being done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and um, thank you for putting up with the technical difficulties for which we apologize. Um, all right, hopefully bringing some of what you've just heard together, um, I'd just like to spend uh, the last 10 minutes um, asking this question about when we go out and run these kinds of statistical tests, have we actually got the wrong end of the stick? Now, um, I realize that that's, to some people, a strange expression, uh, so I dug around on the web to see expressions, sorry, definitions of the wrong end of the stick. Um, and the first one was getting the hold of the wrong end of a walking stick. It comes from the 1800s, and you probably didn't want to get the wrong end of that stick because it had been in the mud and so on and so forth. Um, also from the 1800s, um, from the days of masters and servants, if you got the wrong end of the stick, that probably meant it was the end you were being beaten with, so that wasn't good either. Um, and then from Roman times, even further ago, uh, apparently in the toilet they used to have a sponge, you know, like a sea sponge, on a stick that they would clean themselves with. So in the dark, you definitely didn't want the wrong end of that stick. So which of these are we talking about? Well, wait 10 minutes and hopefully you'll um, be a little clearer about which stick I'm talking about. And it starts with this guy over on the left, um, who Jeff has already alluded to, um, Ron Fisher almost um, 100 years ago, was working at the Rothamsted Experimental Station in southern England. And he poured a cup of tea for one of um, his colleagues, who was an algologist, actually. Um, poured her a cup of tea, and she declined the cup of tea because he'd put the milk in last. And she wanted the milk in first. And one of the other colleagues there said, oh, she can't tell the difference, let's design a test. So Fisher came up with a test with four cups of tea with milk in first and four cups of tea with milk in last presented randomly to this woman, 
And if she got them all right, she'd have a 1 in 70 probability of, of getting that. And he figured, well, okay, that's probably evidence that she can do it. But what's, where is the boundary of evidence that she can't do it? When do you say, yes, that is you know, a, what we today call a significant result? So this T experiment was actually the basis of what we now call Fisher's exact test and was also the first time Fisher ever referred to a null hypothesis, which, as you've already heard from Jeff, has a few issues because this is what we attach this big, soft, spongy thing to, p-values. So, I'm going to bore you for ooh, five seconds. We have a population of data. Here is a percent change of your favorite process, whatever it may be, under ocean acidification. And you can see the data points there. And we have a mean. The mean of the, ob the observed mean change is minus 10%. And just as Jeff was showing, we can generate a confidence interval around about that, which in this case is plus or minus 11. So the confidence interval overlaps zero, which is the null hypothesis. There is no effect. And therefore, we conclude there's no significant effect going on. This is what we do when we run null hypothesis significance testing, perhaps a bit more formally than the overlap of a p-value with a confidence interval, but bear with me. So that's standard practice. And yet... Also, as Jeff showed, underlying that 95% confidence interval is a normal distribution of estimated means. So if we did that 100 times, what that confidence interval is telling us is that 95 of those, uh, mean, sorry, the 95% spread in the center of that distribution would contain the true value of the population that we're trying to estimate from. That's why we do it. And I think we're all okay with that. But at the same time, as we reject the hypothesis that um, there's something going on because the, the, the interval overlaps zero, I could equally erect an alternate hypothesis that the true mean is minus 20, that there's a 20% change is the actual mean going on in the population. And as you can see, it's symmetrical. It's just as likely as the null hypothesis, but it's got really different biological consequences. Suddenly we've got 20% less growth, calcification, whatever it may be, survival perhaps. But we ignore this because we're all indoctrinated, sorry, all with the exception of Jeff, perhaps, indoctrinated with this null hypothesis significance testing paradigm. So if we take this idea out into the real world, um, this is a photograph that was actually taken on a trip that Annika and I took recently to the Great Barrier Reef, and you can still find bits of it that look like this. But what does it mean for organisms out there and studies that we do on organisms from out there? Well, this paper by Christy Croker and a bunch of colleagues is perhaps the most widely cited, cited paper on the biological effects of ocean acidification, somewhere in the region of about 700 citations. And these guys also did what Jeff suggested. They ran a meta-analysis. So they ran an analysis of all the previous studies that had been done, of which there were 228. There were more than 228 responses in there. They looked at what the effects would be of a 0.4 pH unit reduction, which is at the upper end of what's projected for the end of this century. And to estimate that, they measured the effect size, which is just the ratio of the response in low pH divided by the response in the control. But because that's not normally distributed, in fact, it's horribly non-normally distributed, you take the natural log of it, and you've got something that's more or less normally distributed. They found generally negative effects, and they found high variability. And these are the kinds of results that Katrina was just talking about. So you can see here the mean effect size on the left side in, oh wait, that's in natural log units. I don't know about you, my brain doesn't work in natural log units. I translated it to percentages. So 100% there, the dotted line, is no effect whatsoever. And you can see that across these 228 studies, survival, calcification, growth, development, and abundance were all significantly lower under acidification than they were in the controls. And there's a deal of variance around those. And you can see that there's a little star above each one of those because the confidence intervals don't overlap zero or 100%. If we break that down, which Crocodal did, into this figure, which there's a lot in, but I just want to pull out three things. Essentially, we've got the same patterns there. So the blocks at the top are survival, and then calcification, and then growth. So we're coming across this first figure. And on the x sorry, on the y-axis, we've got uh, the effect size again. And I've put the percentages down the right-hand side so you can see. So if we look at survival, for example, then you can see from the left-hand figure, overall, across all the studies, survival was low. 
But up here we've got individually, well, we've got um, negative effects in coral, but that overlaps zero. We've got negative effects in mollusks, and that's significant. Negative effects in echinoderms, but that overlaps zero. So there's only one of those that's statistically significant on its own, but all the mean effects are below zero. So there's something going on. However, if we look at just that one on echinoderm survival, we have a mean effect size of 54% of the control. So on average, across those 12 studies, ocean acidification caused an approximate halving in the survival of the organisms concerned. If we look at the confidence interval, that ranges from 0 0.05 log units to minus 2.4, which is equivalent to 105% of the control to 9% of the control. So with 95% confidence, the true mean of that population lies somewhere between yeah. basically no effect and reducing the population size by 90%. Now, because that result overlaps the zero line, the 100% response to the control, it wasn't considered by the authors. They didn't discuss it. There's other examples in there too. So we can do the same thing for crustacean abundance. We get 130 to 33. We can do the same thing for coral survival. We get 105 to 30. Now, I don't want to be tough on Christy Croker. That one's Christy, by the way, in case you're wondering. I don't want to be tough on Christy. She's a good friend. She's really lovely, and she's exceptionally good at what she does. She's also not alone. Here's another study that was published just a short while afterwards, 107 um, different studies they run a meta-analysis on. They used the same metric. They found negative and positive and interactive effects. And they determined significance when the 95% confidence interval does not overlap with zero. But they also found big ranges, which they just ignored in the responses that did overlap zero. And there's more. I won't bore you with them, but there's several more of these. So what we're doing when we get hold of the wrong end of the stick, I would argue, the bit that overlaps with zero, what we're doing is throwing out the biological baby with the statistical bathwater. We're applying a null hypothesis test and saying, oh, look, it's not significant, and therefore ignoring what the other end of the stick, the stick that we should have, the end that we should have hold on, is telling us. What can we do about this? Amongst the many papers that um, Jeff suggested have been written over the last half century or so, this is what first got me interested in it. It's in biological reviews from 2007. And as you can see, effect size, confidence intervals, and statistical significance, a practical guide for biologists. Ooh, that sounds like me. I hate mathematics. I read this and I learned a lot. I recommend, recommend it highly, and particularly because as it says here, the first two sentences of the abstract, and I'll finish here, null hypothesis significance testing is the dominant statistical approach in biology, although it has many frequently unappreciated problems. Most importantly, it does not provide us with two crucial pieces of information. One, the magnitude of the effect of interest, and two, the precision of the estimate of the magnitude of that effect, which is precisely what looking at both ends of the confidence intervals will do. And I will leave you with a slide of some of the many papers, some of which Jeff has written, but some of which he hasn't, um, that have come out in the last 15 years or so that actually also make this point. And with that, I suspect we will probably be open to questions. Thank you. I have one bit of unfinished business. Hello, hello, hello. I, uh, I propose John as our chair. Moderator. Good heavens. Um, actually, I, I don't, is this one up? Yeah. No, okay. So um, before we start, if people from Launceston or elsewhere want to ask some questions, you probably have to unmute your mic so we can actually hear you. Anyone have any questions? Great, more sushi. There is food down here, by the way. Um, 
Thanks for interesting discussion. I have read a few of these uh, papers. Um, do we really, though, want to just completely throw out p-values um, and significance testing in that in in that sense? I mean, my view would be that yes, there's not enough uh, there's not enough concentration on effect size. Um, the Bayesian approach can be extremely useful in many circumstances. Uh, there's all sorts of problems with the way that um, null hypothesis testing has been applied. But nonetheless, if, if we remember exactly what it is that p-values are telling us and the nature of those kind of experiments, that that still can be useful in interpreting data for some kinds of experiments. I don't, so in other words, there's a context in which provided you get it correct, provided you understand what a p-value is telling you, that, that it's still quite appropriate and useful to use it, which, which means, which doesn't mean that you wouldn't do other things as well with those data, but it's just part of the set of information, the set of statistical properties around a set of data that can, that can help you make reasonable interpretations of a set of data. As you say, if you've got a computer, it's very easy to run you know, 20 replications of an experiment. Uh, in one of the undergraduate classes, we get the students to run a thousand t-tests and it takes R about, you know, less than a second to do it. And they can start seeing what the distribution of those p-values look like and start to get a much, much better understanding of what p means and how you can use it in interpreting um, uh, data and uh, information around null hypotheses. Now, but I would suggest that it is part of, if it's used properly, it, it can be useful and part of a statistical uh, repertoire, um, but that you should be doing it in concert with other kinds of things. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of looking at effect sizes for those kinds of experiments. Uh, I can speak about this for ages, I won't. Uh, one brief comment, if you have a confidence interval then a p-value adds nothing. Uh, years ago, in the 1980s, Kenneth uh, Rothman, a very distinguished epidemiologist, had a big campaign to persuade medicine to adopt confidence intervals and not p-values. And at one stage, I, I had a couple of interesting long lunches with him and made him a little simulation. And at one stage, I tried to challenge him about, well, look, where you've got these designs with big complicated um, interactions, we know about p-values of that, but you really can't do anything sensible with confidence intervals. And he says, aha, yes, I can estimate you a confidence interval. And then he'd explain how he would do that. And so this went on as I tried with multivariate and I tried all sorts of things I could think of where maybe we could get a p-value but could not get a confidence interval. And in every case, he came up with things. Then a few years later, he started the journal Epidemiology and he was the founding editor of 10 years, and he declared at the start, this journal does not publish p-values, and for 10 years, he did not publish any. The journal flourished, did good science, using estimation primarily, um, and he was also successful, he and others, in getting the International Council of Medical Journal ed editors in the middle and late 1980s to sign on to uh, a protocol that basically made quantum intervals routine in biomedicine, as it still is, although very often those intervals are published in tables and hardly referred to, and still decisions are made in terms of p-values. And so I think to sustain an argument that p-values can have use, we need to look at particular situations, and I have yet to be shown them, maybe I can be, where uh, it really does add things that an estimation approach uh, would not. I know there are people who make that claim, but I'd still like to see the, the detail. <laughs> Katrina has no comment. I can, I can perhaps add, uh, I, well, just, just one thing um, that I d it's, it's encouraging to hear what you say, Craig, because um, you're, I suspect that 
Um, there are at least as many people who don't understand p-values as well as you do who are out there uh, publishing them. I could be wrong about that. I might be doing my fellow scientists a disservice. Um, however, I did uh, just yesterday in uh, digging out information for, for this presentation find precisely the kind of meta-analysis that um, Jeff, amongst many people, have been advocating um, for, for many years. But that meta-analysis was a census count of p-values. So out of a hundred and something studies, they simply counted how many of them were significant and how many of them weren't. If we'd done that with lung cancer, then the cigarette companies would still be doing really, really well because those studies weren't statistically significant, but the effect sizes were all negative. And if you put them all together through a meta-analysis, then you do get a, a statistically significant result. So um, I, I partly see your point, um, but uh, I think there's a danger if we rely on p-values too much that even the tools that are meant to uh, replace them actually you misuse them in a way that's uh, misinformative or uninformative. Um, question for Jeff. You, you seem to be saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, we should publish everything. Um, could you expand on that and just what you mean? Uh, are you advocating doing away with peer review? Or is it just uh, we do the peer review and regardless of the results, we publish it as long as it's a well-designed study? What? what? Um, uh, excellent questions, and these are very live issues, as perhaps some of you know. Uh, over the last three or four years, the annual convention of the Association for Psychological Science has sort of been a, uh, a venue for some really, really impressive people debating exactly these issues. Uh, certainly hasn't been settled, I think, although there's quite a lot of consensus that uh, the primary thing is that any data collection, any study done to a decent scientific standard, and we can debate that, of course, then the results need to be publicly available. Now, whether this is in some uh, archived secure database or whether it's on the front page of Nature, well, uh, just so long as it's retrievable by somebody doing a meta-analysis, then we have a decent chance of avoiding uh, publication bias. And the mechanism that in many fields to quite a big extent, although certainly not everywhere all the time, the best way to achieve this is pre-registration, the sort of thing that's been uh, promised in clinical trials for a long time, although not always honoured. The idea is that, okay, you do any sort of exploratory research you like, you figure out your measures, your procedures, uh, your hypotheses, your questions, etc. And then you say, okay, here's what I'm, going to, uh, what I'm going to do. You write out your protocols very, uh, in a detailed, careful way, including all your data analysis plans. And then uh, uh, some journals are accepting those plans, putting them out to peer review, which is great because you can get uh, good feedback even before you collect data. Then the journal might uh, uh, accept it provisionally. Then you go out and run the experiment, collect the data, analyze it exactly as you promised you would, and then you have a publication. Uh, and the results, whether they're immensely disappointing or wonderfully exciting, uh, are out there in the, in the um, public sphere. Of course, along the way, there are always hiccups, and you just have to uh, uh, document those. And if there are any excursions from the pre-registered plan, you have to explain them and uh, perhaps analyze both ways. But that seems to be emerging as one of the important um, mechanisms for trying to avoid uh, uh, publication bias, while admitting that this is not a one-size-fits-all sort of thing, just as we can't say, oh, everyone replicate things 20 times, because it's hard in astronomy if you're studying supernovae, and if you've only got one trip in the big boat down south, you can't sort of magically do another 20. So replication's not so easy. But these are the issues that um, folks developing open science procedures are really grappling with. And it's very exciting to see it. You know, we're sort of redefine, refining and improving the scientific method as we're going. And I think that's great, and I think things are getting better. I have a question from Launceston. Go ahead. 
Is there any tests statistically that resample the data of your data set which are preferential to use? Does that make sense? Uh, I think that if you're referring to bootstrapping, jackknifing, uh, resampling statistics, I know there are people who are expert at it and swear by it and say, we really should grow up and use this as the basis for how we teach, how we explain things, how we do it. Uh, I'm not really expert at it, but um, I have played around with it and I think it is very promising, the idea being that, okay, we collect a data set and then we try to figure out something about the precision uh, it provides us for the answers to the questions we're asking by doing resampling within that single data set. And it, it sort of seems like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, which I guess is why it's called bootstrapping, but there are arguments that justify this as a reasonable approach, at least to some extent. And so it could well be that down the track, um, we're using a lot of Bayesian estimation, we're using a lot of bootstrapping, ultimately we're doing what I'm sure some of you do, and that is make, uh, do quantitative modeling and then do goodness of fit between your quantitative models and your data. That's terrific, in a way that's a sort of gold standard down the track. Uh, Never again should any single thing, p-value, confidence interval, anything else, be used in anything like the universal way that significance testing and p-values have been used uh, right across science. Do we have any other questions from Launceston? Okay, I've got a question. So you talked just about briefly about um, bootstrapping techniques and you've talked about open science in um, you know, registering and having peer review on how you're going to approach something with a guarantee of acceptance of publication at the end, regardless of whether things are significant, turned out as you planned, um, whatever else. Um, and you also talked a little bit about effect sizes. Um, what other techniques would you recommend to get around p-values? What other techniques? Well, uh, one of the slides I skipped over had the basic argument, okay, open science, at the heart of it is replication. Ultimately, what's going to convince us that we have something we can believe is that somebody else observes it also uh, in other places. It can be replicated. It's potentially replicable and hopefully has been replicated. Now, if we're going to replicate, then you need some way to integrate uh, the results of the studies. And the best way, usually, perhaps almost always, is meta-analysis, which relies on estimates from every study. You need a point and an interval estimate from every study, and therefore you need estimation, which we pretentiously call the new statistics. Now, so that's our sort of basic approach. Um, even if you think some people are, well, look, okay, Sometimes I don't care how big the effect is. Or perhaps the extreme example there is ESP. If we could be, could we, if we could be persuaded that some paranormal phenomenon was reliably, in an ironclad way, different from zero, well then we'd have to, maybe we're very hard to persuade, but if people presented data consistently at that, then it, it, we'd have to take that seriously as a challenge to the science we know no matter how minuscule the effect was. And yet, how are you ever going to persuade anyone other than by being able to run a whole lot of studies and integrate the results, which means you need estimates from all those studies uh, and meta-analysis, and only then uh, could we even potentially persuade. So estimation has to be the key of things. And even if we get to the stage of quantitative modeling, hooray, hooray, that would be great, then we'll probably spend a fair bit of our time estimating parameters of that model, as some of you may do, and then we need to assess the goodness of fit between that model and some data. And 
the measure of goodness of fit is itself a thing you estimate. It might be percent variance, it might be root mean square, or it might be um, AIC, BIC, or something or other, some measure of goodness of, of, of this um, model in the light of the data set. And we need that to be an estimate. We need to have uncertainty. We need to have the equivalent of a confidence interval on that measure of goodness of fit. So the estimation approach seems to me to be a very broadly applicable thing in open science and we'll just have to be skillful in drawing on a whole lot of types of estimation um, techniques for different situations and these might be Bayesian, they might be uh, resampling and so on, but it's still some sort of uh, estimation. Uh, perhaps I should say explicitly, I think this is a, an immensely important mind shift from the dichotomous, uh, my colleagues mentioned various versions of this, significant not versus to what extent, how big. And talk to anyone out there uh, who want to use the results of science and pretty much always they want to have some idea of, well, to what extent would it make a difference if I use this technique or license this drug or use this therapeutic procedure? Um, and that means they need to know um, estimated effect size. So all, all arguments seem to me to be pointing to um, estimation. Did you have in mind some other particular thing that I haven't mentioned? No, I was just curious. Okay. <laughs> but, but I do have a follow-up question on meta-analyses. So if we've got a bias towards publishing studies that um, show significant responses in terms of p-values, how do you think that affects your meta-analysis and effect size calculations? Uh, the trouble is that we don't know to what extent it does. And people are now just beginning to trawl the uh, serious attempts to trawl the file draw. No, let me step back a bit. The basic problem of the file draw was recognised by Robert Rosenthal and others quite early on in the 70s, alongside the beginning of meta-analysis. And they developed all sorts of ingenious techniques to try and assess to what extent it was a real problem. But it's hard to look at this set of studies and from them have any convincing idea about how many and what sort of studies are not there. Because any model you use really has a lot of probably quite extreme assumptions. So what became standard practice, you may know, is that you've got to look very carefully in the grey literature. So you go and look at theses and conference abstracts and you email all the active researchers and say, give me your file draw and everything you possibly can to try and flush out anything, which, okay, is a pretty good step and there's tons of evidence that the grey literature that is flushed out typically has uh, smaller estimated effects, uh, often not statistically significant. And so, yes, it was worth looking in that file draw, but we never know under that sort of model um, what else is out there or was ne you never bothered uh, writing it up and putting it in the file draw. And so, prospectively, open science is the way to solve this problem. But at the moment you put your finger on a, a really big issue of meta-analysis, all the stuff out there in the literature uh, up until uh, open science really has a big question mark over it. The size of the question mark we don't quite know. It may be bigger in some disciplines than others, but there's a, an unknown question mark over it. And that's that's a problem. Sorry, whilst that microphone's transporting, I, I realise that I, I perhaps um, inadvertently impugned Ron Fisher um, for his um, invention of the null hypothesis and um, also recommending P equals 0 0.05. Uh, it's worth pointing out, if you go back and read his book, um, that he never ever intended that we use it as harshly and dichotomously as we do, but rather that, um, in fact, I think there's a, there's a quote from Naaman and Pearson um, on a similar topic that, and whether the p-value is 0 0.04 or 0.06 is of no consequence. It's rather a guide to whether or not you should repeat the study. Um, and uh, all of the, the founders of, of this were very much into the idea of repeating studies so that you could do, at least at that stage, an informal meta-analysis of the kind Jeff's been talking about. Uh, I've got a question for Katrina. Um, 
I was, <laughs> that was... Nothing <laughs> else. <laughs> um, sorry. Sorry for waking you up. <laughs> no, this was about um, your uh, correspondence with the Nature, Nature Journal. I was just wondering whether there's anything you think you could have done to avoid the, that misinterpretation of your uh, paper and your results. No. I, it was... No. I think our... So our... What could we have done? We were, I think we were making a valid comment, you know, that there was a lot of problems with the research. People didn't want to hear that. And then when we were asked to comment, we were very measured. But as I was saying, that the reporter then asked a lot of other people who were less measured. And those are the comments that got picked up by the other media. So I, I don't know if we could have done anything different apart from not, we could have not published the paper. Um, the first paper we wrote actually didn't have the solutions part in it. It only had the problems, and I think that would have been an absolute disaster. <laughs> so I don't know what we, I don't think we could have done much better. John, I think John, John was on the other side of the world, probably in the firing, in the, did you get the email train? Yeah, so John was actually getting the other side of the story in the Northern Hemisphere. I, I, it was quite alarming how what we thought was a useful paper was picked up by the media. So a follow-on question from that, Katrina. How do you um, rebound from um, something that's taken completely out of, not context, but, well, yes, context and how it was intended? Um, how do you sort of we had to well the well so my inside knowledge from Philip Boyd when he ran into my office telling me um, there's a shit storm going on basically well, uh, the first thing I did was email uh, one of the uh, Jean Pierre Gattuso in the Northern Hemisphere and just said look this was not the intention of our paper it's supposed to be helpful and he had actually peer reviewed that for us already we'd asked his opinion previously so. Um, how do we rebound? By the time the Oceans in the High CO2 World Conference came along, which was about six months later, uh, we had at least one plenary and quite a lot of other people talked about the paper and how helpful and useful they'd found it. And that, you know, one of them just said, Sam DuPont just said, look, we've just got to suck it up. We didn't do it well. So it actually took about six months, I reckon, for people to accept that not everything was perfect. Had to avoid trying to be on a high horse, though. There are so many stories along these lines, alas, and some of you may well be working on uh, uh, climate change sort of research or research that can be interpreted in that context. I have a, a colleague, Steve Lewandowski, a psychologist, who has, uh, with his group, uh, chosen to work on the uh, psychological aspects of belief, belief uh, influence on people's attitudes and beliefs of extreme, uh, apparently empirical claims, and then the difficulty of trying to undo that. So think of um, anti-vaxxers and climate deniers and so on and so on and so on, where on the basis of some apparently, at least somewhat scientific evidence or claim, people will latch onto something that presumably fits their belief system and then the difficulty of trying to change that. And, and the, the, that group has studied various ways of presenting things to try and uh, change attitudes. Extraordinarily difficult, no surprise uh, to you. And he, this is, has been an incredibly painful thing for him because he gets trolled, he gets uh, incredibly nitpicking arguments about all sorts of things that maybe have 5% of plausibility and he's got to spend his life going back and quadruple checking everything and debating minute points here, there and everywhere. And uh, his vice chancellor is berated and he told, told to have sacked this terrible band scientist and on and on and on and on and on. And um, this is immensely dispiriting, of course, but also emphasizing um, 
how important it is we understand these things and have uh, ro as best we can robust publicity mechanisms to try and um, counter them. All strength. They need it. Okay, so if no one has any further questions, we might thank all of our panel speakers for a very uh, interesting round of talks and insightful discussion. Okay, and then, then we're going to move on to the second um, part, which is the workshop exploring some of these uh, issues and alternatives in more detail. Um, so how did you want to run this? Well, um Yeah, good idea. We'll take a, a, a five-minute break first, I think. Um, and people, there's some feet up here, so please help yourselves to some food. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff, I have to leave for this, but um, thank you. Thanks for coming down. It was really yeah, nice to meet you. Should work. Hello, hello, hello.
Hello, hello. Does this come over? Ah, yes. Hi. Okey doke. Um, well, what would you like to do? Uh, what I had spent weeks preparing is uh, a little bit about significance roulette, which can either be uh, two minutes of fun or I can explain it all, and then a bit more about the background, or the rationale for open science and what it means. And then I was going to put up the contents list of the book and you can point to things and say not that, not that, but maybe this. So what's your interest? Shall I plough ahead with that and you can stop me and fast forward me or... Okay. Okay. So as you may have, uh, I didn't explain, but you may have picked up my shorthand for uh, uh, p-values is three stars, two stars, one. Oh dear, you don't want to hear this one, do you? And if we took the, uh, where are we? We took, this is the distribution of the p-value after p equals 0.05. Now I could have a go at explaining why or the process by which we get that, but it's probably better if I simply refer you to the, if you're interested, the significance roulette videos. Video number two of those two does go through and explain uh, what this sort of bit of, seems a bit of magic that after, all we need to know about a study is that it gets 0.05 and we can derive this uh, PDF. And then if I, uh, let's see, I divide the area under there into 38 equal sections, 38 sub-areas, and I label each of those with a p-value that's sort of typical of that little sub-area, lots of them over on the left, very tall and narrow, and various ones here up to some that are up there, then it turns out I get this distribution you saw before of the different categories of p-value, and if I take those 38 values and distribute them haphazardly around the wheel, this is what I get. Now, who would like a p-value to save themselves months of work data collecting? Who would like a p-value? It doesn't hurt. Yes, okie doke. Spin the wheel, in with the ball. Where is it going to land? <gasps> Two stars, well done. That's a decent publication. May not be in nature, but are you well on the way? But being a good scientist, you'd like to replicate, wouldn't you? Yes, you would. Whether you want to or not, we're going to do it again. I wonder if... Uh-oh, I think you didn't quite get your procedure. Well, you get the idea. By the simple flip of the wheel, you can get anything from three stars to uh, p greater than 0.1, and that is accurate. That is justifiable. So, let's see what I was going to do here. Uh, again, these slides are not yet up there, but they will be, and so feel free to consult uh, if you would like. So why have p-values in NHST persisted? Various suggestions have been made. The tyranny of the discontinuous mind, this is our inherent yearning after certainty, seems to me um, pretty important. And Fiona Fiddler has published this PhD on it, and you can download a PhD or read a PhD as a PDF there uh, and see her analysis. It's Ten years old now, but still um, uh, quite apposite, I think. But it seemed to me that uh, after 50 years of all this cogent rational analysis and, debate, uh, and, and advocacy about why these techniques have a problem, 
more of the same was not going to really cut it and so I put my effort into these sort of uh, play acting uh, uh, things trying to demonstrate, trying to dramatise just one aspect of the problem and p-values. Oh, there are the... Um, if you go to YouTube and just search for significance roulette, uh, you will find them. Uh, that's the wheel... Uh, well, there's the distribution. That was for the typical experiment I had, two groups of 32. That's after P.05, and this is after P.01. So, of course, after 0.01, you'd expect more likely you get a small p-value, but still you've got a very broad range of possibilities. And the wheel, okay, it's got a little bit more red and not quite as much blue, but it's still uh, a very, um, very broad range uh, of values. Uh, seen all that. Stop me and ask at any point if you'd like to say more about that. Now, another way of looking at that is there's this weird inconsistency. Every intro stats book has a chapter or more on the sampling variability of means, explaining what the standard error is uh, and ways we can counter this, report this, reduce this, and so on. Sampling variability of confidence intervals. Any book that does a decent job of explaining them has a picture like the dance of the confidence intervals. And yet, not a single book that I know of, before my two, um, even mentioned that there was something uh, that even existed, sampling variability of the p-value. And yet, it is just as core in all of statistical modelling that uses them. And there are better ways, and I've oh, mentioned these briefly along the way, with quantitative modelling being, I guess, the gold standard. Another way of looking at it is, OK, we had half a century of this thing not being able to be uh, squashed, and then meta-analysis came along, which requires estimation, does not require p-values. Why did that not lead us to change? Good question. I was disappointed. Now we've got open science coming along, yet more reason to change. And the big question in the balance at the moment is, will that be sufficient for us really to make a thoroughgoing change? Just the other day, the journal Political Analysis, which I'd never heard of, declared that it would no longer ever publish a p-value. So there you go. Um, now, just a little bit about open science in the background. It, a lot of the discussion has been in psychology, but it probably started in cancer biology and, and medicine, and certainly there have been uh, lots of evidence from other fields as well. And to um, the Centre for Open Science was set up about 2013, gee, nearly five years ago now, under Brian Nosek in Virginia, and it had two big projects at the start. One was RPP, the Rep Reproducibility Project Psychology. It set out to choose, in a, a, a good sampling way, a hundred studies in social and cognitive psychology that have been published in half a dozen of the top journals, chosen with uh, well-specified criteria, including that they could readily be replicated, and then getting a hundred groups around the world to volunteer to do the replication, uh, setting up very strict protocols to get these replications as close as possible to the original, pre-registered in every sense, reviewed, etc., etc., then eventually uh, went ahead, exactly the same to the extent possible as the original, except usually they were much larger sample sizes. And here are the results, published in Science in 2015. In fact, there's a tussle between science and nature, and nature got some of the data and um, scooped science by publishing their own analysis of it. Then the official thing came out in science. So here we have each blob is a, an original study and its replication. So the position along the horizontal is the effect size, uh, actually it was a correlation they used in each case, uh, of the original, and vertical was the replication. So here was a study that got quite a decent 0.4 or something original effect size and got zero 
in the replication. Dots on this sloping line got more or less the same in the original the replication. Now, uh, of course, there were headlines about, oh, only one third would replicate, two thirds are disastrous, etc. Uh, and uh, that's falling into the trap that uh, my learned colleagues earlier in the discussion sort of saying, well, uh, st significance and non-significance uh, is not enough to guarantee there's a real difference between them. But the way I'd like to, uh, the, the summary I'd like to emphasize is that on average, the replication effect sizes were half the original effect sizes. Or to put it differently, if we regard the replications as being the more trustworthy, because they were pre-registered and uh, usually more precise estimates, uh, then the published literature out there, the, the original studies, overestimates reality by a factor of two on average. So that's true that um, broadly speaking, all those literatures are giving us uh, estimates that are twice their, the size they should be, well then we have a severe problem. No doubt that factor of two differs across different disciplines and different situations. And um, uh, there's, there has been running for a year or two now a reproducibility project in cancer biology, and there may be others as well uh, in train, trying to estimate the extent to which we do actually have uh, a replication crisis. John. If, if I understand you correctly, then as best as uh, they could, they reproduced those studies using exactly the same methodology, granted a slightly larger sample size. Exactly right. So, and so it's, essentially that difference is the kind of sampling variation that you were showing me between the roulette wheel? Uh, the, <clears throat> the, the fact that um, in any particular case, we should think of these dots as really being ellipses because we've got a confidence interval horizontally for the initial study and vertically probably a bit shorter for the replication study. And so uh, given these data of the two studies, reality is most likely somewhere within that ellipse. So that's sampling uncertainty. But the fact we've got a systematic overall uh, factor of two difference in effect sizes uh, is attributable to, uh, we can never be sure exactly how to attribute it, but most likely will be uh, some combination of uh, selective publication plus p-hacking, plus tweaking or selection or something uh, going on improper at questionable research practices, QRPs, to influence the results. We uh, believe that the, uh, or they claim, and I think they have good reasons to, that the replication experiments have none of that, or at least much, much, much less of it, because of the very careful um, pre-registration and the fact that whatever results they got, negative, zero, positive, whatever, it was going to be published. It was going to contribute there. And that was not true of the originals. Virtually all the originals except maybe one or two, were statistically significant. So we don't know about the ones that may have all their pilot tests that you know didn't get into the literature. So another way of looking at that is to say, well, uh, one estimate of the extent that adopting open science broadly would change things is it would halve, on average, the estimates of the size of effects out there in the world. Boy. That is really a dramatic claim to have to make. And now, um, social and cognitive psych are the simplest, the low-hanging fruit, the simplest things on the whole to replicate. Uh, but once you get into clinical and biological things and um, industrial and so on, uh, developmental child psychology, it can be much harder just to get 150 participants to do your uh, bigger replication study. And um, uh, people are now beginning to grapple with the practicalities of trying to achieve replication uh, in these other fields. Please interrupt me along the way if you like. Or I've been to so many talks where it's okay to say, oh, please slow down and say that again. But nobody seems to say, for heaven's sake, get on with it. Just rush on a bit, would you? But feel free to do that if you'd like. Now, this was considered really quite notable. This is not just psychology washing its dirty linen in uh, public, 
but both nature and science chose this publication, this project, as their, in their top ten for the year. And so here, uh, Brian Nosek is the guy uh, head of, who led all this, is leading the Centre for Open Science. And here are a couple of nice quotes there about how dramatically this was seen by science. And so I think this nomination of this work as landmark is justified and let's hope it um, really leads to changes in practice. Well, this is Andrew Gelman. You might know of him, a very notable statistician. His blog is often very incisive and critical of various sorts of things. He's made some acerbic remarks about our use of new statistics. That's all right. Uh, but here he's making some pretty strong statements about science up until the open science era having this big question mark um, over it. So here's the sort of list for open science. I've sort of talked about those to some extent. Very happen, happy to expand on any of that. Uh, inevitably, over a number of years, the first question asked is, yeah, 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 that's all very well, but look, I'll go away from this room and I'll go back to my supervisor or my colleague or my funder or something and look in the journals and I've just got to use p-values. That's the way it's done. Well, mercifully, the world is changing. And month by month, it is getting less impossible. And there's an ethical question too here. Each one of us as a scientist is ethically bound to choose the best practice in our particular field for our questions uh, that we can. That's what the scientific method is. It is current best practice. And now, if you don't get ethics approval, if you don't use meta-analysis, if you don't use the latest, uh, best, most justifiable type of staining or um, imaging or whatever, then you're not doing best practice. So if you after having reflected on all this, don't just take my word for it, you reflect on all this and consider it, if you reckon that using estimation is best practice, then you are duty bound to choose that and to argue for it. And so you might have to spend a fair bit of your time uh, answering back referees, but this is science and that's the way we push things forward. One of the things that the Centre for Open Science has done is um, set up these TOP guidelines bringing together a big conference of journal editors. This was just a couple of years ago. The Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines to encourage journals to um, uh, encourage, facilitate, perhaps even require the good things like making data openly available like fully reporting all procedures and methods and materials, uh, perhaps adopting pre-registration. And there's this big table of desirable things down here like open data and complete reporting and pre-registration. And then different positions that a journal could take across here, starting from zero, which is don't even mention, through to one, acknowledge and encourage, through to two, uh, facilitate and eventually to require. And the idea is to try to move journals to the extent that it's practical and desirable in their own situation further to the right. And um, uh, last night when I checked, now more than 5,000 journals and scientific associations have signed up, meaning that they undertake within 12 months to review all their procedures for author requirements and so on and so on in the light of the TOP guidelines to see the extent to which they can move their requirements and practices to the right. Now this doesn't guarantee they'll all make the shift or make any part of that shift, but it means that they have undertaken to think about it seriously. Now 5,000 journals, that's an astonishing achievement in a couple of years. It means that there is a real see change in awareness of these sorts of issues, real progress. Uh, 
Right. The Center for Open Science I've mentioned. Its other big project beside the replication project is to build the open science framework. And this is an open uh, resource on live course designed to help you manage and document every stage of your research so that your working papers, your decisions, your successive versions of your protocols and your materials uh, and your data scripts for analysis uh, are all there, date stamped, and of course you can collaborate with folks all around the world. And they work very hard to integrate this with um, GitHub and Figshare and Google Docs and all the other sorts of uh, things you might be using. So that even if different people in the team using different ones, you can uh, document things in OSF. And of course, you can put up your um, research plans and date stamp it. I'm pre-registering this, and that can be either kept confidential or open to the world. And then perhaps later on, you can make it open if you wish after publication. And anyone can look up the link and see that, yes, back in that date in the past, this was the plan. And so I can compare that with what was published and feel confident that, yes, we did have successful pre-registration there. Um, part of this is the realization that, OK, we're all insanely busy. And if anyone's going to change their practices, it has to be easy. It has to be easier than the old way, if possible. And this is a great resource for doing that. And um, I know quite a lot of people in psychology are, for example, collaborative replications and education project, CRAPE, run by a really dynamic guy in California, John Gray. This is a network of uh, usually senior undergraduate sometimes beginning graduate projects for replication. So anyone can say, look, I'm really interested in this study. Uh, anyone interested in replicating it? And then people, often not in super research-based universities, but uh, needing to do some research and needing to give their students, senior students, some research projects, will sign up and say, OK, we're going to run part of that. And you might get half a dozen, you might get several dozen groups do this, and a couple of years later, you'll have a publishable thing that is um, uh, a meta-analysis of a whole lot of projects that have followed these protocols and provided more precise estimates. My um, colleague, uh, co-author on the book, Bob Carlin Jagman, uh, at a little university in Chicago, has an uncanny knack for picking studies that uh, are not really worth trusting. I think he's done 11 of these now with groups of his students and all but one. And he does very careful pre-registrations and gets in touch with the original authors and double checks everything about the procedure and matches exactly what they did and so on. All but one, Bob and his group get uh, pretty much zero effect. Or well, they get a confidence interval um, centered roughly around about zero. And so you've got all these results out there in the literature over here. And you've got Bob's pre-registered shorter confidence intervals over here. And so he's just can pick it. And he's uh, personally um, identified a number of things out there. They're probably just plain wrong. The, uh, this is another uh, little initiative with an um, openness initiative. Reviewers, anyone who reviews, ever reviews manuscripts, and that's everyone, is invited to sign up to this which is really making a simple declaration that if asked to, um, to review a manuscript, you say, I will, provided that uh, a couple of basic things. The data are made openly available, or there's an explanation why this is not possible. And uh, uh, if the editor and authors are not prepared to do that, then you'll, your review will be, I am declining to review this because this thing was not made. And um, uh, this is another pressure, another, another way of operationalizing the attitude change of all of us with a different hat on instead of 
applicants for grants and researchers and authors with our referee hats on. Uh, oh, there's the thing, yes, it's not just psychology here, and nor is the, nor is the PRO. And here's the symposium I mentioned last October, A World Beyond um, OPAR. Anyone want to say any more about any of this? I, please. Uh, are you asking about some of these differences between originals and replication? Maybe, a, yep. I mean, that, that's a, um, uh, a key question, and the extent to which that is relevant, of course, will vary a lot across topics. I mean, if you're talking about um, uh, attitudes towards anything, there are certainly going to be lots of specifics about which culture in which country in which year uh, if you're talking about the characteristic of short-term memory or something, probably much less so. And um, uh, the, all the replication project psychology things were all done within about three years, I think. Uh, and in fact, there's been some quite interesting debate about the extent to which uh, cultural differences might be playing a role, because some of these things were... Uh, originally done in the States and then were replicated in Germany or vice versa or something. So, of course, we'd expect some uh, cultural differences depending on what the, uh, the issue was. So all I can say is that, um, sure, there might be moderating variables helping explain some of those differences, uh, but that is discussed as part of the um, whole operation. Uh, another aspect about OK mainly within psychology um, not quite on this exact topic, but in the topic of um, statistical cognition. Of I, for the last 10 years before I retired, 10 years ago, um, my sort of research, direct research area, empirical research area, was statistical cognition, studying how uh, researchers, authors, students understand things, depending on uh, understand things as a function of how they're presented whether it's uh, in p-values or confidence intervals, in graphs or words or et cetera, et cetera. And there's tons of low-hanging fruit still there. I think it's a great research field. And this is a case where psychology does have a special role to play because although there are a couple of hundred disciplines from archaeology and astronomy to zoology that use statistics, psychology has got the skills actually to study that cognition. And sure, we need advice from statisticians about models and techniques and things, but we also need advice about, given that it's humans writing it, it's humans who are going to read it and interpret it, we want to know about uh, how different types of presentations will um, exacerbate or help undermine cognitive biases and perceptual biases we know are out there, which techniques will be uh, more successful. Um, and and um, partly because it would be easy for this to be a whole lot of little love in amongst psychologists it, where it shouldn't be. It's terrific that the real grown-up statisticians, as I say, ran this thing and now have legitimised the world beyond um, O5. Please interrupt at any moment if you like. Oh, here are the badges introduced by Centre for Open Science and uh, more and more journals are using these and that means um, if you put in a paper and you make available online in full detail uh, all the materials you used or your data or a red one, a pre registered then you get badges like this. And I think all Bob's replication studies get all three badges. And in the journal Psychological Science, probably the top empirical journal Psychology, I think over the last year or so, papers would have, on average, about one and a half badges, something like that. Pre-registered is still not very common, but the others are increasingly common, and that's, no, real grown-up people. Do we really respond to elephant stamps? Well, this is an acknowledgement that you've done the right thing. Uh, uh, 
Oh, this is, I mentioned a bit about that. This business of, of, of this psychological aspect, now, test yourself out. If you read mean improvement was 10.0, P less than 04, you'd probably think, oh, pretty solid. Okay, yeah, got it, significant. But if you automatically think of 04, that means the 95% confidence interval extends almost all the way down to zero. So the confidence interval, a bit like uh, one of John's examples, is something like 10, but extending from 1 to 19. So there it is, here. Now surely you have a different take-home message. You have a different way of thinking about that. And the best way to interpret a p-value is probably to generate in your mind's eye the equivalent confidence interval. And there it is. Uh, I call this the cat's eye picture on a confidence interval because it's sort of the relative likelihood or relative plausibility of different points. Your best bet if there's your point estimate is somewhere around there. And out here, or out here, successively less good bets. The end of the interval is nothing special. Outside it, well, even less good, but this shape shows you the uh, relative likelihood. And a 95% confidence interval, it's about seven times as fat there as it is at one of the ends. So in the book, and in Esky, the software that goes with the book, we have a lot of emphasis on graphical presentation of uh, effect sizes and confidence intervals. And in some basic cases, this can be novel simply because, uh, as simple as, we put the confidence interval on a difference. If what you want is really to examine the difference between uh, the pH of um, 6.5 and the pH of 6.9, then your effect size of interest is that difference, and therefore your interval estimate, your confidence interval, should be the confidence interval on that difference. And there it is on this floating axis there. Here is zero, there is two, the difference, and we can say the confidence interval extends from minus a half to four and a half or something. That's what you need to know. For independent groups, this is scarily long very often. For paired data, where you've got correlated pairs of data, this could be quite short, and that's a good reason for choosing a repeated measures study, uh, repeated measures design. And so again, you've got the difference and you've got confidence in what the effect size that will most directly answer your research question and the confidence interval on that. So why can't SPSS and SAS and all the standard uh, statistical analysis package, packages give this sort of picture as its default immediate um, output? Uh, confidence interval of correlation, they're typically asymmetric and usually surprisingly disappointingly long unless n is very large. If you've got a two by two table, you sort of knee jerk reaction, look for chi square, but think of it as the difference between two proportions, uh, which here is 0.3, and put a confidence interval on that. Okay, that doesn't include zero, p is less than 05, in fact, chi square tells you it is just on 05, but this gives you a much more realistic idea that we're estimating the proportion that survive. Uh, and we've got a lot of uncertainty in that estimate reflecting very small sample sizes. So here's um, the book. It launches straight into um, estimation, meta-analysis and open science. And uh, if you go to, oh, I thought I had the link here. Uh, if you go to thenewstatistics.com, then at the top of the page, there's a couple of lines of um, text, and one of them includes, perhaps the second sentence includes a link. You can download this chapter one, the contents in chapter one, uh, a free PDF download, and you can read all about it. It's um, no, uh, no formulas at all, very introductory, but it tells in brief outline the whole story of open science, meta-analysis, 
estimation, and everything else is just bells and whistles uh, on top of that. So if you want a brief, easy to read summary as you're nodding off at night, um, I would suggest that. And then we get into some of the more standard intro textbook stuff about basics of design, basics of descriptive statistics and sampling, then confidence intervals, then chapter six, an optional chapter, perfectly happy if you skip it, but we explain about p-values and we do it uh, by knowing about confidence intervals and piggybacking p-values on them. And particular emphasis on the red flags for p-values, that is the, um, I think it's five or six uh, big issues that can be problematic to watch out for. Then for the rest of the book, our focus is on estimation, but if you click in the software, you can show a p-value. Uh, not recommended, but perfectly okay. You can do the whole thing without ever doing that, but they're there. Uh, and in seven independent groups, you can look at dance and the p-values. And then pair design, meta-analysis, uh, and uh, so on. Open science comes up in chapter one, more so in chapter 10 and uh, at the end. So it's used and referred to all the way through. The first took textbook that does that for open science and also does some estimation all through. So really that's the smallest board there of stuff I could talk about and I'd be perfectly happy if you'd like to nominate any of those to hear something about or if you'd like to ask me about anything I've talked about or something you have in mind or we could uh, revert to eating sushi, whatever you like. I mean, I'm in your hands. Right, right. Well, first, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, first, congratulations for even grappling with the issue. I think that's sort of step one. Um, Bob and I, as authors of this book, which we hope will change the world, and we believe it's exactly the way the world should change, have grappled with this a lot. The first thing we've done is um, tried to make the book as accessible and sort of self-explanatory as we can so that in working through it, hopefully not beaten around the ears with, on every page with this ideology, but what we do, we hope we've justified pretty well so it makes sense. Uh, the second thing is that one of the big issues about changing over is that any of us who are in the trade for more than a little time built up their set of favourite exercises and quizzes and data sets and examples and so on and so on. And you suddenly want me to chuckle that out and start again. Well, no, many of those you'll be able to bring across. But on our website, we've got a, and Bob has done a lot of this work, I've done some, we've got a truckload of stuff of databases and quizzes and examples and um, student guide and teacher guide and lecture guide. Uh, 40 or 50 brief videos explaining various things and so on. Uh, part, uh, partly this is to give people a big smorgasbord, a, a big um, range of stuff they can choose from. Another is so that if you choose or are required to have a sort of flipped classroom where you say, okay, uh, for next week, um, read these six pages, watch this video, answer this quiz, then come to class and you get a brief quiz that you know counts for a tiny amount of credit. <coughs> Pardon me. And then we can discuss some further examples or identify which are, where the problems are and work on that. Uh, uh, next thing is um, we reckon that Sure, there's a hump to get over. You've got to persuade colleagues you're co-teaching with and the rest of the department because what do they do after first course? They have to go into the second course and third course. But we hope, it's our belief and our experience, that you'll have such a good experience with new students teaching this first thing, based on chapter one and so on, that that will be rewarding in itself. 
one reason for the negative one, it undercuts this whole terrible reverse logic thing of having to say to people, I'm sorry, but just trust me, follow me. Stop thinking too much, just do this, one, two, three, four, and that's what we all do. Trust me, that's what we look in the journals, that's what they do. And uh, to the extent we possibly can, we try and explain things so that people in the street, it would sort of make sense to say that the result of the election or the result of the opinion poll support for the Prime Minister is 17% in the poll with an error margin of 3% or something, which you see in the newspapers all the time. That's the basis. We're, in essence, we're not doing anything more complicated than that. And so if folks can grab that and come back to that and see that pictorially, that should, uh, in our experience, make it a joy to teach. And in fact, um, the forest plot for mayor analysis is a similarly, it's one of the, the, the few times in my teaching life, maybe you've had more of them, but when you meet up students later on, a few years later on or something, and talking about, chatting about various things, and they say, oh yeah, mirror analysis. That just made sense. Hmm, okay, that's terrific. Perhaps nothing else did, but it made a lot of sense. There they were, and you um, uh, combined it all, and there's the result. And so did that pictorially, uh, as we do in the simplest way in Chapter 1. And then again, you should have something that is coherent and makes sense and fits with the whole story. Uh, the feedback we're actually getting from the field, in the first year of this book being out, we sold about 1,200 copies, and the publishers gave away hundreds of um, inspection copies. And the feedback from the field was, uh, from the salespeople was, people love this, they reckon it's great, they recognise it's exactly what should be happening, but for me, right now, it's too hard. Maybe I'll be forced to one day. Okay, I caricature a whole lot of comments, but that's one of the elements coming through. So we hope that month by month, semester by semester, uh, this will change. And we know that some of the big intro textbooks, and some are in their ninth edition, they've got a whole team of authors and several truckloads of materials online, they're beginning to put some of this stuff in. So this is definitely the way the world's moving maybe some of those big boys will get the jam when the sales rocker. Maybe we won't, but at least we're cracking the door open. And again, as a teacher, there is an ethical dimension, and we can decide the extent to which we want to invest our own time and effort and so on to, to um, push that. But um, I hope that if you persist and are a bit nagging with your colleagues, that before too long, you might be recognised as um, doing the right thing and a wonderful pioneer rather than a, uh, a dreadfully painful nutter. A maverick in science. Science needs its mavericks, even if not all of them turn out to be right. <laughs> so, um, what would you like to do? I know in Oxford in the seminars they had this wonderful formula for saying very um, Oxford. Oh yes, is, this is where we um, uh, we have a brief break, and anyone who is, needs to catch a bus can can catch a bus. And so either 98% of people suddenly have buses to catch, or one person sneaks out. So if you want to have a catching a bus pause, we can do that now. <laughs> or I'm happy to go on and talk about any of those. Ah, now you're talking. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm very glad you mentioned that. Now, I need to go back and kill this. Okay, this is an example of the. Uh, no one thinks. Um, this is an example of the Esky software, 
and it's the, um, there are three of these workbooks that go with the book, one for chapters three to eight, one for or, um, uh, three to six or something, and one for 10 to 16, and then meta-analysis, which is chapter nine. Yeah, there we go. <coughs> uh, and so there are only a limited number of pages for different uh, types of meta-analysis, different measures. So this is not for a moment intended to be a um, uh, a sort of uh, general meta-analysis, data analysis package, just one little me on Saturday afternoons, not enough resource to do that, but it's meant to um, uh, be a setting in which you can do non-trivial educational things. In fact, it's become quite widely used and uh, even in published stuff. Well, here's an example of a forest plot, this picture, with uh, a Cohen's D, that's a standardized mean difference. And this is one of the, the, uh, the example we use in the book, is one that uh, a, a replication study, a set of studies that Bob did. So a woman in Germany did a total of these six studies which were examining various, uh, the effects, the performance effects of various superstitions. And the original one and the most famous uh, is about the lucky golf ball. Sorry. So the lucky golf ball. So the task is, we've got a, uh, a little sort of tin thing over there that's the golf hole and back here and you have to putt it and try and get it in the hole. And perhaps the distance is a bit less, I don't know, but anyway. Uh, some participants, volunteers would come in and say, John, thank you very much for signing up and coming along today. Now, um, your task, and, and, and you have the lucky golf ball. So this is the golf ball that's running hot today, the lucky golf ball. Would you please take the lucky golf ball and you know, do your best? Good luck. Boom, boom, boom. And you get 6.5 out of 10 on average, you and the other people in that group. Other people come in and say, um, uh, okay, here's your task, oh, and there's the golf ball, and good luck, and da -da -da. And they got 5.4 or something, and the result was in standardized form an effect size of about 0.8 of a standard deviation, a substantial effect. But here we are, it just happened to be statistically significant, not quite including zero. Then there were other studies from the same lab things to do with having your lucky charm with you or not and all sorts of bizarre things, okay? And then Bob and his group came and did a pre-registered replication after communicating with the German group and uh, even sending videos of the protocol and getting those corrected and here was their result. Then they did another large pre-registered replication where they tried to exacerbate the effect by using what should have been if anything's going on, an even stronger sort of emphasis on the superstition, and again got zero. And so, uh, even if we didn't, uh, even if we didn't have these two studies there, just look at these studies, we'd immediately think this is hardly dance of the confidence intervals. Look, a bit suspicious. We get six things all um, just. Uh, slightly statistically significant. Most of these p-values would not be very extreme. So is there some selection going on? Is there some p-hacking going on? Well, uh, we don't know. They weren't pre-registered. And so here we suspect that Bob's group has got better estimates. Now, of course, there may be other <coughs> um, moderating variables we don't know about. German students may be different from American students in a way that relates to superstition, hard to believe it may be. Maybe there are other subtle things about the procedure that's not quite the same. Uh, but this is meta-analysis and in a single picture there, it tells you a story of a, um, uh, of a uh, research literature. And down the bottom, we've got the overall, uh, the tradition is a diamond as the result of meta-analysis as you probably know it's a 95% confidence interval represented this way. Uh, and if you've set up in advance that, okay, this is one subset, this is another subset, then you can 
say here are the originals with this overall uh, effect size and here's the uh, Bob replications and the difference between those is this on this axis going from zero there uh, and there's the confidence interval on the difference between this set of group studies and this set of studies. Uh, and so what you do here is you type in a label, you type in the values of Cohen's D which is translated to an unbiased version, your sample sizes and that's all you need to do and you can do your uh, meta-analysis and get all the quantitative results there. So does that sort of, in that simple situation make sense? It's what open science needs so that we can integrate results over replication. Did you have more specific things in mind? Um, no, I, I'm more thinking about there's a lot of you know, machine learning techniques that they don't they're not like that, but it's not just one computer. Right. It's certainly, um, meta-analysis is, is far from a mechanical procedure and anyone who's ever done any meta-analysis non-trivial size knows that <coughs> it's really challenging to go to the literature and extract uh, appropriate effect sizes in a fair way across all the studies and find the appropriate confidence intervals and then you're always having to make decisions about what's in and what's out and there's an exception here and these measure something slightly different and so on and so on. Whether you put those in as moderators or lump them all together, what so there's lots of decisions needed in meta-analysis and it's quite, now in principle you'd like to sort of pre-register what you do in a meta-analysis but you can't really do that because you're doing the analysis, doing a meta-analysis because you're somewhat expert, you probably know at least half the literature anyway so you can't sort of come at it fresh and that's, that's, a, um, that's a real question. Best usually we can do is just document very carefully and in detail exactly what decisions we made all the way along and why we chose this measure to do the analysis on rather than others and maybe we do it a couple of ways around and see if that makes a difference. <coughs> but even non-linear modelling I guess you've got some estimates or some parameters in there that you regard as the important summary answers to your questions and whether they're percentage weights or their regression coefficients or whatever they are and they are the things you may consider putting into your meta-analysis. Uh, back in the early days of meta-analysis there were ways of combining p-values, converting them to z-scores and so on and so on but uh, that is really um, sort of desperate measures that we should never need to resort to uh, these days. Catch a bus, okay. Thank you for your questions and for coming along. Yes, it's perfectly okay to go and catch a bus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is ESCII for the um, uh, 
chapters 10 to 16 and uh, in this book, an intro book, we only go a small step in the direction you um, would like to go in. Uh, now let's see how I can, oh no, uh, yeah. Um, So uh, in chapter 15, we consider the, uh, sorry, we consider the independent group's two-way design. So here we have a A1, A2, B1, B2, and you might have the evening-morning effect, the sleep, no sleep, sleep, no sleep effect. And here are the means and confidence intervals. And you might want to know about the interaction, which we represent as the difference between the two differences. So there's the difference between sleep and no sleep at evening and the difference between sleep and no sleep at morning. And there is the difference between these two differences and there's the confidence interval on that difference. So in other language, I could say, here we've got an A, B design with two levels of A, two levels of B, the two independent variables, and the A, B interaction is of size 1.2 with confidence interval from about 0.1 to about 2. In fact, we've probably got the up here, we've got the, yes, 0.0017 to 2. 2, 3, 2.30, 2 um, that confidence interval. And so we're following exactly the same sort of idea of trying to get the effect size that really we're interested in and put a confidence interval on it. Now, I immediately um, agree that once we go to three-way and so on and so on, more complex designs and larger numbers of degrees of, of, of um, levels for each independent variable, it very quickly gets very complicated. Now, then you may elect to use as your effect size um, uh, eta squared or partial eta squared or omega squared or some of those squared measures, and you can put confidence intervals on them. And um, Tabachnik and Fidel is one of the big commonly used in social sciences multivariate statistics books. And since about eight years ago, it has had confidence intervals in all of its chapters where it's possible for those sorts of things. I find those measures incredibly hard to give decent intuitions about. So I've really shied, uh, fought shy of it. The other thing we do in, um, uh, in this, if we've got independent, here we've got a study that is, as an example, it's only one uh, one independent variable, but it has six levels. And so we'll make a contrast, um, a linear contrast. So this is some feeding experiment, and uh, we might have all of the 10-month-old groups versus the 17-month-old groups. So we might select that and that and that as one subgroup, and this and this. And this is the other. And so once again, here we get the mean, the difference of the means between the 10-month groups and the 17-month groups and a confidence interval on that difference. And so we can say the main effect of A123 versus A456 is such and such about three and the confidence interval so and so. So that would be a planned contrast a planned linear contrast combination of means. So again, that doesn't solve every situation, but it's another strategy for, in complex designs, choosing a contrast that is relevant for your research question and putting a, estimating it and putting a confidence interval on. So we're trying to apply that same strategy as broadly as, as we can. Uh, yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Um, I realize that if you have six groups, then you can just chuck them into this and it will do it for you. But if you have a different design. Uh, no, we, well, uh, no, we don't. Um, I think it's fair to say we point in the direction of it, okay. but we don't have formulas for all of this. Now, um, all of this, um, these sheets are protected just so it's harder to screw up, but there's no password required. So if you know what you're doing, you can, not even a tiny bit of Excel, you can unprotect them and look at all the formulas and, and do that. But of course that's roundabout and not terribly simple. Um, but we're operating at a um, uh, intro textbook level, so we're not giving all formulas. Uh, in most cases, I think you could sort of figure it out as a bit of an extrapolation for what we have. The other thing I should mention about, thanks for the positive comments about these uh, spreadsheets, that uh, we use these pop-out comments very freely. And if you look at a first page like this for the first time, you think, my God, that's a dog's breakfast. I'll never understand that. But strategy one is, Look for the little red numbers. One, where's two? Usually they start at the top and sort of go down mainly. There's two, there's three, there's four. And of each of those, you um, look around at some of the pop-outs, you probably get the idea of what this bit does and then what this bit offers and then this bit and so on. And hopefully that allows you to follow it all through. Um, for each of these sheets, there's at least one video that goes through the example that's there when you open it up. So you can just follow along and watch. And of course in the book there are uh, usually step-by-step -step examples and things using this and lots of figures from ESCII in the book. So again, that's another way you can sort of uh, follow it through and hopefully find it uh, relatively tractable to, um, uh, to use. There, is, there it is again, if anyone uh, has either questions of your own or any of those you'd like to look at. Sorry, how? Ah, uh, right, yes, good question. Um, now, uh, I really built ESCII rather reluctantly because I'd much prefer not to reinvent wheels and things much. And I made the decision, gee, it's almost 20 years ago now that that was the way I was going to go in developing the software uh, as being a way that I, with a day job, could get stuff done because you get so much provided already in Excel. And this is way before R really hit the big time. If I were doing this again, I'd certainly do it in an open source sort of way and pull on the maximum amount of other stuff. But still there's a limitation. I'm not really an R expert at all, but I think there's still a, a, a big issue in R about the extent you can do graphical things. And what I wanted above all with ESCII was to be able to have things graphical and highly interactive between the data and what you clicked and did and what happened on screen so that beginning students could see that it gets bigger or it does vary or something's wrong here because the, uh, and interpret like that. And that's still its strength, I think. But uh, Bob has, uh, with the book, there is a workbook for using it, using this book and these materials and these exercises with SPSS. That's the dreadful load is, that's what so many people use. And also, um, uh, so increasingly, not so much at first year, but increasingly even at first year, students are being introduced to R and Bob's got a workbook that allows that to happen. And if there's ever going to be a second edition in a, uh, a year or two or three or four, one of the big questions will be, do we still have ESCII? 
do we supplement it? Well, we'd certainly supplement it to, to what extent and in what way and so on. And there are two very interesting projects going on at the moment. One is JASP, J-A-S-P, Eric Margenmarkers in uh, Netherlands, which is an open source R thing designed basically to um, bring SVSS into the, this century. Much simpler um, menus and things like that, but doing a big part of um, what SVSS can do, including Bayesian equivalents, which is his particular uh, thing. And then his, uh, a guy called Jonathan, I forget his second name, who was DJ's lead programmer, they sort of two strong, highly intelligent guys had a bit of a falling out and Jonathan left the project and set up a thing called Jamovi, I think it's J-A-M-O-V-I, um, which again is open source R and uh, an SPSS replacement, but without having to do all the Bayesian stuff. And he's based in Newcastle in Australia. And um, he's very keen to build in a whole lot of new statistics sort of routines and possibilities within Jamovi. Uh, so you can download either of these things at any time and um, play around with the latest versions. Um, I know the JASP developers well and they keep saying, yes, yes, we'll have to do some new statistics stuff and conference intervals, but their heart really is not doing the Bayesian routines, not in all the graphical things. So maybe one or other of those uh, would do it. If I had a couple of years of uh, programming resource available to me, I'd talk seriously to Jonathan about doing a major revamp of Jamovi along these sort of lines, in which case maybe that would be the thing that is the natural successor to ESCII and would bring uh, these graphical uh, flexibility and richness and simulations along with the heavy, what ASCII doesn't have, the really heavy duty flexible statistical calculation analysis things which we need as well. And that really would be fabulous. So anyone with a spare couple hundred thousand or something, that would be one thing to invest it in. What do you, what software do you use? To, all sorts of modeling software or what? Uh, everything in R. And so you draw, the, you use the libraries to the extent you can or you write stuff and yeah, yeah. And you swap relevant things with other researchers in the same field and yeah, that's good. Oh, how did you get that confidence into the wrong way? Yeah, I guessed. <laughs> Seemed about right at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's another thing that um, OSF, that's tied in with Git, GitHub so that, you know, you can refer to stuff and transfer across or uh, put stuff in GitHub and have it integrate very well with OSF and things. So that's good. And then document your various versions of your analyses, scripts that eventually led to what you published. Sorry, um, when we look at the range of confidence intervals that... Oh, you mean the length of the interval? Yes. Yep. Uh, this, um, Jack Cohen said many years ago, he put his whole, um, a lot of his uh, effort over many years to persuade people to use statistical power. And a colleague of mine um, interviewed him not very long before he died, maybe 20 years ago, but um, uh, if you had your time over again, would you choose to do power? And he said, no, 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 I would have chosen to put my effort into confidence intervals. Now, he had advocated confidence intervals, but he reckoned that um, uh, if psychologists really understood how low power their studies were, on average around about 0.5, um, they'd be horrified and they'd design bigger studies. 
And so he, he had papers doing this. He provided power calculation tools, had two, um, three editions of a book that's still one of the key power books in social sciences. And people sort of yawned and went ho-hum and didn't calculate power and didn't increase the size of their studies. And power is still around about 0.5 across a whole lot of fields on average in, in um, social behavioural sciences. Um, and in many fields it's even less than that. So why do we bother? Mm. Just, just correct me yeah. one quick, but uh, doesn't your stem sort of do that when you do cognitive science? Doesn't that also calculate power? Uh, yep. Yep, and in fact, the, the example I standardly use, two groups of n equals 32 with a real effect of half a standard deviation, that has power of 0.5 or 0.52 or something. I think the only reason that that, that, that had so much um, trust through the people that I've shared it with, and I, I know that certainly in the yeah. case of uh, Tony Matthias, who we were talking about it earlier, yeah. the whole idea that um, a biologist, an experimental biologist of the kind of thing that we do, would run an experiment with 32 replicas is beyond crazy. Five, seven, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to run an experiment like that with 32 replicas, and even still, you're dreaming. You've got so <laughs> time is dreaming. Um, <laughs> you've got such like power yeah. and, uh, and such highly varied with p values. I think it's yeah. a really salutary yeah. lesson. And and you said the same thing in different form by saying, I calculated a p value, but I wept. Why can't I just tell you, sorry, I calculated a confidence interval and here it was. And it was Cohen who said, the real reason psychologists don't report p-values is because they're so disappointingly long. Well, <laughs> we're going to suck it up. And that's telling you accurately the amount of uncertainty. It also means if you do achieve this, you can feel very, very happy and smug. Oh, I admire your confidence interval, so short. <laughs> Are we going to catch buses? I have a car that's yeah. 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 Thank you for coming along. Keep up the resolve. Anything else you'd like to talk about? Ah, hello. Anyone out? Oh. Hello. Anyone out there in cyberspace? Sorry, I have been. Uh, uh, not uh, very sensitive to your presence and your needs. If you are there, would you care to speak to us and would you care to ask a question? A voice booms from on high. Okay. Oh, we're all off on the bus. Thank yes? you so okay. much. I have no questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you for sticking around. Good on you. Bye. Uh, anyone else like to suggest anything? Sorry, is yep, yep, yep. Let me see if I can try and express that. So you're working in ecology where distributions are likely to be highly non-normal. You have maybe a small data set and you use a resampling approach to try to do some sort of analysis. Uh, and traditionally this has been hypothesis testing. But if you use, say, a resampling or some other method to get estimator confidence interval, it is alarmingly and disappointingly long, but at least we know that, is he saying? Yes. And we can be even more disappointed, but at least 
we can feel we have an, uh, an accurate representation of the degree of uncertainty. And hopefully this will be justification for um, uh, going to funding bodies or whatever and saying, I need to be able to spend longer in the field or you decide to study a group together a larger number of species or whatever you do in order to, uh, or you have a simpler experimental design, not with so many uh, independent variables or something, in order to get, uh, be able to estimate your effects more precisely. And their decisions at the heart of experimental design and that's the essence of being a scientist, to be able to find research questions that are of interest that are tractable given the methods and resources and the world that we have to operate in. Especially challenging maybe for ecology. It's easy for me to say this stuff, but it might actually be the, the way it is. So we're talking about estimating effects in ecology, yes, and? Yes, how do we best estimate the size of the effects of interest? So that's, uh, that's a key question. Is it a percentage? Is it an abundance? Is it a rate? Is it a um, decay? Is it a concentration? Uh, I mean, they're questions for you, the ecologist. And then how do you get sufficient uh, independent cases or individuals so that you can get, do some summary statistics and perhaps even inferential statistics? Key questions. I don't know if it helps, but one of the things that I've really appreciated from moving towards following the exercises and confidence intervals instead of relying on dichotomous p value is that it puts the onus back on me to interpret it rather than just give that responsibility to some bunch of statistics in a computer that I can't understand that then comes back with an answer that either makes me happy or sad or maybe in some cases curled up in a little ball like you get um, mm -hmm. p greater than 0 0.0 plus 0 0.5 or whatever. Um, I, I just get a number back and it's like well that's the mean effect and you know here's a confidence interval it might be asymmetric but that's what that confidence interval is. So then that begs the question of me, which I guess I tried to get across a little bit in that presentation I made earlier, of, well, okay, so this end tells me that there's nothing going on, but this end tells me quite a lot, and somewhere in between those two is the truth. And maybe that's actually all that we need to be able to take the next step forward, rather than necessarily simply because tradition has said, saying, oh, yes, but it's statistically significant. I mean, frankly, that's not a Let me just mention briefly, perhaps on the way to the bus, is some um, chapter 10, Open Science and Planning Research, power, and in the estimation world, power doesn't have any meaning. 
So we use precision, and we use precision for planning. And uh, <coughs> oh, pardon me. Uh, in this is the worksheet. We have uh, this graph. So if we're trying to design an experiment, two groups, each of size n, and we would like to get a result that is, say, plus or minus 0.4 of a standard deviation, that's our margin of error, then we need two groups of size 50. Then uh, if we do that, on average, our uh, confidence intervals will be plus or minus 0.4. And if you'd like to be assured, two groups of size 65 gives you 99% assurance that your confidence interval will be no longer than plus or minus 0.4. So usually this is rather sobering. Two groups of 65, you've got to be joking, I'll be pushing if I get to eight. Well then, the consequence is your confidence interval is likely to be plus or minus 1.1 or 1.4 or something uh, standard deviations. And so this is precision for planning, saying I want to do a study that is most likely going to give me a confidence interval not bigger than about that. Oh, that'll cost a million dollars. Okay, I'll accept that. Ah, you can do that for your budget. And so it's that sort of trade-off. And that's what um, the new statistics equivalent of power is for planning studies. <coughs>